Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, happy New Year to everybody. Yeah. Good to see everybody. I'm Keith Brooks. I'm part of the faculty development team. Uh, and welcome to Primetime at the BU Library. Primetime is a collaborative project between the friends of the BU Library and many offices on campus that celebrates learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of fellow faculty, students, and staff. Faculty, have you received an exceptional research project that requires significant library research? Encourage your student to apply for the $250 library research project. That's pretty good. Sponsored by the Friends of the BU Library. The deadline is February 15th. There is information on the library website, on the display in the center of the atrium, or you can ask a librarian for more information. Next Tuesday, February 5th, We'll welcome Egrin scholar Dr. Dmitry Medvedovsky, Medvedovsky and junior Andrew Raymond as they share their research on Lithuanian family economics, religion, and health outcomes. Today, we welcome Associate Professor of Education and Director of Early Childhood Services, uh, uh, Jolene Pearson and Beth Quist from the Working Family Resource Center as they present Premature Babies or what some people call premium, right? Is that another French word, premium? <laughs> A different beginning, information and resources for parents. Let's welcome them. Um, I invited my um, colleague, Beth, to come because over a year ago I was asked to put together this webinar for the Working Family Resource Center in collaboration with the Minnesota Department of Education. And as I got to know more about what Beth's group's doing, I thought it would be really valuable for staff. Some of you are parents, not only parents of young children, but teens, and they have information, but also for faculty to know there are webinars online, and I'm going to let Beth tell a little bit more about that, that they want, might want to access on behalf of their students. Sure. Thank you, Jolene. Um, uh, Working Family Resource Center is a nonprofit uh, organization. We're part of LifeTrack Resources, located in St. Paul. And it's our mission to strengthen individuals, families, and communities by providing them education and resources to help them manage um, the, often the conflict that they may experience between work and family. Um, for the last five years, we've been working in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Education to really create some strategies online for um, parents and specifically reaching beyond the Twin Cities into greater Minnesota using online technology. Uh, what you're going to see today is a piece of that project that we've been doing with the Minnesota Department of Education. And in back, there are some handouts of this year's webinar series that we have developed. Um, they are designed for parents of young children, birth through age five, um, providing some very um, good expertise and evidence-based child development and parenting information uh, for parents to access. Um, and Jolene just did hers in January. We had wonderful feedback and response to it, so I'm really excited that you'll get to see a piece of this. But if you're interested, this is the series. These are all recorded and archived, I should mention that, posted on our website. The previous two years are there as well. Um, and then they're also linked to the Minnesota Parent Snow website that's created with uh, the Minnesota Department of Education. Okay. Right. So and it, there's some more in back. Yeah, we just wanted so. you to have the background for this. All right, so this was the presentation that I did on January 9th. Um, here I am. Um, as you look at this photo, I want you to cup your hands, and Beth is going to pass out a few um, baby babies to give you some idea of really how small we're talking. I think a lot of times when people think about a premature baby or you see a lovely picture like this, the baby looks perfectly formed um, and you just think, oh, it's just a small baby that will grow bigger, but really nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so I wanted to just have you have some idea if you think about a mini baby and where that fits in your hands, and then I wanted to pass it on to the baby that really does fit into your hands. So when I was working at Children's Hospital, the family that I worked with that had the smallest baby ever was 12 ounces. So not even a pound, and that child survived with some difficulty, but did survive. So what, you know, when you think about when is a baby really premature, um, you hear different people say different things. But really, the, the official definition from the March of Dimes is any baby born before 37 weeks. A full-term pregnancy is somewhere between 
38 weeks and 40 weeks, depending on your period. And that's why there's that two-week gap. So, um, but a premature baby is anywhere under that 37-week mark. So one of the things to think about, I don't know if you've seen the new March of Dimes commercial. It's a um, really cute song, Every Day We Are Getting Stronger. And they have that music in the background, and they show a woman who's pregnant in time-lapse photography, and her belly just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the new message that the March of Dimes is giving is that 40 weeks, you want a 40-week baby. And it's interesting because over time, you can always hear stories about you know, babies born four, three months early, four months early, that did really well and all of this. But by and large, what we're going to cover today is going to show you up the other side of some of that. Um, and that the March of Dimes has done extensive research with different groups and have found that even a few weeks early really impacts the baby's development and learning later on. So now the new message is you've got to really press for the, <laughs> press for the 40 weeks. Um, here's some preterm birth statistics. And it's really interesting to know that in our country, um, almost one in eight babies is born prematurely, or about 12% of the children in the United States. And you might be interested to know in terms of the, the scheme of things in the world, we're not doing so well. We have many more premature babies born in the United States than are born in third, some third world countries. So part of it is um, our health, our diet, our stress, our environment um, has really impacted our ability to, to carry babies to full term and healthy. So this was a really interesting table I thought I would share with you um, just to give you some ideas. So again, I think in the general public, people, when they hear someone had a premature baby, they might not be too worried because they'll say, oh, but you know, we heard of someone that survived and so on. But let me tell you, if you're one of those parents who has a very early preemie and the doctors come in to talk to you when there's less than a 4% chance of survival, you're told some pretty scary things. Um, and so obviously, with the increasing gestational ages, things go better. Um, now, I was sharing with Sandy before we started. For about 17 years, I did a class. I developed a curriculum in a class called Parent Circle that I did at Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. And in this class, I took research I learned out in Boston in my master's degree, and I kind of combined it with my parent ed knowledge and created an opportunity for parents to learn when this happens to you, what are the things you need to know, what are things you can do, what are questions you should ask. And in this class, um, 18 years ago, I met Scott and Shelley Barsoon. And um, we just immediately bonded. Their child was born at 24 weeks gestation 18 years ago. So you have to know that they weren't told very good things. But they came to my class and they were eager for information and then Shelly said information is power. Um, and Sophia survived and she went on to write this great book called Growing Sophia, The Story of a Premature Birth. And I subsequently discovered that Scott and Shelly Barsoon met at Bethel. They're Bethel grads, they were married. I think they were ring by spring, I've heard that <laughs> tossed around. <laughs> so I wanted to just read a little bit from Shelly's book when you look at these statistics. Before Sophia's birth, I hardly realized babies were born prematurely were at risk, and I didn't know how many people had given birth to a premature infant. Now, former preemies were everywhere. They came forward in a crush. They were all grown up, and I am told doing just fine. Everyone we ever met who had a preemie, or know someone who was, a cousin, an aunt, a grandmother, in one funny cliche among NIC parents that every family has a great uncle Ollie who was born weighing two pounds or something and miraculously survived when parents tucked him into a shoebox and kept him warm in a cold rainy oven. I laugh, but our family legend involves the great grandfather, Albert Gibson, and his twin brother, Arthur, born in 1882. The doctor estimated their weights at two pounds apiece and said they would never live. But parents, being English and determined, wrapped them in cotton bags in any way and put them in shoeboxes and kept them in the warming oven of the grassy farmhouse cold burning stove. To everyone's surprise, the babies got fat. They grew up, took up farming, married, and lived into their 80s. So people tell us their miracle stories as if these foretell a happy outcome to our crisis. So many premature babies have done well for themselves. Not only did they live and thrive, but they were doctors, writers, adventurers, fathers, mothers, composers, and PhDs. The only ones who don't tell us the success stories are the doctors. <laughs> they offer statistics instead. If, after a week, Sophia is still alive, the chances of her having a life threatening incident will decrease. The other half of the babies was Sophia's age and weight experience bleeding in the brain. And almost nobody tells us the stories about premature babies who have cerebral palsy or who didn't make it, but we know about them. 
Through the privacy panels carried on the occasion when the doctor is prepping a couple to make a decision about their ventilator dependent baby, we probably hear um, that this child will be disabled. Among the tubing and equipment, we glimpse the gnarled, contracted hands of a baby with a severe brain injury. We hear a nurse softly asking the parents of a baby who is dying, would you prefer that I call the priest or a chaplain? So in Shelley's book, she chronicles the behind the scenes story. So I just wanted to share that, that these, with these statistics come some really difficult um, experiences for parents. So here are two premature babies, one baby born at 24 weeks gestation, which is approximately four months early, and another baby born at 34 weeks gestation, just you know, nearing term, but not quite there. And the interesting part to know about, of course, the baby who was born at 24 weeks gestation stayed in the hospital much longer. And, um, and you can just see that even as far as how this baby looks. I used to have pictures in my, pre my presentation that parents shared with me, the ones that they thought looked so wonderful. And Scott and Shelley said that they took their first pictures of Sophia and rushed out to have coffee together to look at their beautiful new baby. And as they looked at them, they said, oh my gosh, we can't even share these with our family. She looks like a burn victim or something's wrong. You know, So your perspective really changes. The baby who was born at 34 weeks gestation <coughs> didn't stay in the hospital too long. But because she was born early and had a high belly room, she, had, she suffered hearing loss. So again, that's another story about the fact that even though it's not, you know, this child is almost at term, the rifts for developing some of these um, disabilities are there and, and do happen to these children. So um, in my webinar, I talked a, a lot about what is meant by development, um, because sometimes parents aren't really sure. And I know a lot of you in here are in education, so I'll kind of go more quickly. But it's really how children learn to do more and more complex things as they get older. And one thing when you have a preemie is that every parent is worried about developmental milestones. <laughs> You know, every parent wants to be sure their child is going to be able to walk and talk and think and learn. Um, and so they kind of focus on milestones. But for parents of preemies, sometimes the first milestones are things like coming off the ventilator, um, being able to take an oral feeding. So the whole experience of parenting shifts to something that is very, very different. But what I always try to assure parents of preemies about is that you almost have to study fetal development to know what comes when. So I would go through reflexes with them and different things that happen. Because the sequence of development is essentially the same for children, but it's just that you're seeing the baby develop skills that were, for most children, developed in the womb and more fully developed by the time they were born when you're looking at a full-term baby. So um, this was a really helpful picture to get because this child was born at 30 weeks gestation and it says he weighed 3 pounds 11 ounces and was 17 inches long. But for a parent who, at the beginning, like Shelley says, you know, you hear these stories of success, but when you're looking at this, you want to know how, how you're going to get to this and will you get there. And to be honest, there's no really good way to know. Uh, you just have to take it a day at a time. One thing I loved about this picture is that for parents who are looking at a baby who's ventilator dependent, and sometimes they have to paralyze them, so it's a really eerie feel and look for parents, the thing that really makes them jump for joy is when their baby can first open their eyes and say, I'm here, and the parent can begin looking back. One thing about premature babies, though, is they have very um, highly sensitive systems, and so sometimes I... Beth, you want to hand me one of my bears out here, one of my kitchen plates? <laughs> is, um, I've got the really teeny one. Maybe I need a bigger one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sometimes when the baby finally opens their eyes, with a full-term baby, parents hear over and over again, you have to provide stimulation, you have to provide stimulation. So parents of full-term babies are, hi, baby, how are you doing? Oh, have a look at this mobile. And, you know, they're doing all these things. And for a parent, a, a full-term baby, they kind of can pull it together and say, wow, that's a really interesting novel. Or, I'm looking at your face and I'm hearing your voice. Preemies have an underdeveloped nervous system that instead of pulling together and concentrating, goes, oh my gosh, and it flies apart. So a lot of the teaching I do with, with when you finally see their baby's eyes wide open is to get off to the side and maybe talk. But you can't look and talk at the same time because the preemie goes, oh my goodness, what is happening to me? 
So anyway, so that's a good slide. This is the same baby, and it's um, it's got some yesterday. Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right. So these are the variables that are going to um, really affect how the developmental trajectory goes. One of the things is just simply gestational age. Um, no matter how much, you know, I was, it's so funny when people say, oh, but he was two pounds. And my first question is, can you tell me how many gestational weeks he was born at? Because weight is almost inconsequential. Sometimes mothers are diabetic and they give birth to what sounds like a fairly heavy preemie, but that preemie is no more developed than whatever their gestational age was, if that makes sense. Birth weight does make a difference. Um, how much time did you have to spend on mechanical ve ventilation? The quicker you can get off of that, the better. And now they have beta-methasone shots where they can give the mother injections if she hasn't delivered yet, which helps the baby's lungs develop. And then they have surfactant where they can, it comes from the baby pout cast, they can put it into the baby's lungs so they take their first breath, they blow it down, and then they don't stick because they don't have surfactant when they're too young in their lungs. You can maybe think of people on go that had lung problems after prematurity, and a lot of it was they didn't have surfactant. So that's again like a miracle thing. How much oxygen do you need? Um, white matter energy, um, that's intraventricular hemorrhage where you have a brain bleed, or periventricular leukomyelasia is where parts of the brain actually calcify and can never develop again. So again, um, these babies that are born early are constantly <coughs> monitored, and if they think there's a problem, they get a head ultrasound, and that's always a real anxious thing for parents, because are they gonna find one of those two things? And just your overall length of time in the NICU, if you can get through that about your due date, you're good, and you have to gain weight. Um, another thing I was sharing was there are many resources online. Um, the people that make um, synergists, so babies that are born prematurely, if they were to get a cold once they come home from the hospital, so people want to say, oh, the baby's home, let, let us go and see the friend's baby. A lot of times parents are terrified because they've been told you can't get a cold because a cold can be life-threatening. But I just love this that um, preemievoices.com has this whole packet that parents can go online and order for free and it has a way to check your things. It has a handout specifically on what to tell your relatives about washing their hands and staying in aid. And so back in the day when I was first starting this, parents were like, they felt rude. You know, they, they had a baby prematurely, and you know, for mothers, they were not psychologically prepared to give birth to this child. So there's a kind of a really big disconnect about what's going on. So oftentimes, mothers are grieving the loss of the pregnancy, they're sad, and then they have people saying, can you come over? <laughs> and I used to have parents that made buttons say, I'm cute, but don't touch, or touch my head, or um, they put big signs up, the doctor says you have to walk, because they felt like they couldn't defend their babies. But I'm so glad to know now there are professional materials developed for them. What else? Now, here's another thing. So, how, when people say, well, how old is your baby? Now, your baby was born prematurely. You've got kind of an issue because um, you may understand it, but other people don't. So, if you were born like growing Sophia, little Sophia was four months early, what you have to do is you have to subtract weeks and months born early from their chronological age. So here's, um, I just tried to give a really simple example. From the time the baby was born, they're six months from their birth date, but they were two months premature. So what would you expect this child to do if you were looking at a screening or you're trying to figure out are they developing well? You have to look at their corrected age, or sometimes people call it adjusted age. And so primarily preemies are, you can't develop anymore quickly when you're born prematurely. And I, I was doing the parent circle and I had grandparents come and there was a grandpa who was really trying to be an optimist and he was joking with his daughter who had just given birth prematurely. So Samuel's going to do well because he got into the world early and he's going to get it quicker. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> so, um, you know, so sometimes people try to really try to figure this out, um, how this works. Maybe I'm going to just go back to this just for a minute. Okay. Oh. So in Sophia's case, she was born in July at 24 weeks gestation. Her due date was in October. So I knew the family over time. And so when it came time for kindergarten, the question was she was ready for kindergarten because of her birth date. But she was having a really hard time with fine motor skills. Her gross motor skills were not great. Cognitively, she was really impressed. She loved 
reading <coughs> activities. So that was all good for school readiness. But they decided to hold her back. And then we had a problem because the school district said, but her birth date says she should go to kindergarten. And then what we had to argue was for adjusted age. So you're going to hear there's a kind of a mythology out there in, um, that you quit correcting for prematurity at age two. But I'm here to tell you the only reason they do that is because that's a research protocol. It has nothing to do with, <laughs> with um, reality about development. It's just that most researchers, when they're doing that, will go up to age two, and then they'll decide to shift to another developmental tool for which they don't correct. So when people say, oh, you, you know, if they're caught up by two, well, a lot of children really aren't caught up by two, but it doesn't mean that they won't catch up. Another um, piece of information I always share with parents is it isn't a matter of catching up because you can't really catch up. But the point is, normal development, you have such an array. For example, children um, can walk at age nine months. Well, but that's really early. Lots of children about a year old are, are going you know, just a little bit beyond that. They're starting to walk. And then by 16 months, if your child's not walking by 16 months, pediatricians start to worry. But they're going to give them from 9 months to 16 months. So a preemie isn't really catching up. What they're trying to do is jump into somewhere in that, that, that develop normal, typical development. So um, I just wanted to share that, that that's one way I've tried to help parents understand it. Um, and then in our presentation, of course, we wanted to acknowledge Minnesota parents know is a website that the Department of Ed has, and you can go to these different age groups and find different information about parents. There's a lot of things. There are videos, there's downloads, there's just, um, just many, many things. And in our state, um, I've been involved in early childhood special ed for quite a while. And like I said, it used to be that they wanted you to wait till your prematurely born child was almost a year old to decide whether or not you would be eligible for early intervention. Well, that's all found by the wayside. Now on the Minnesota Parents Know website, there's a, a click for Help Me Grow. And this is our statewide system for uh, referral into uh, screening for early intervention or early childhood screening for preschoolers. It doesn't guarantee you'll get service, but what you do is click and then it will ask you a series of questions. And then someone from your school district contacts, contacts you and comes out and does an evaluation of your child. With the prematurely born babies, um, they're very interesting to me. They decided to go by weight in our state. They said if you're born weighing 3.45 3 pounds or less, you are automatically enrolled in early intervention if your family wants. It's always a volunteer service. But I just wanted to go back to that for a minute because remember what I told you, weight is, weight is nothing. I mean, it's really what leads to station. So there's a group of us that were just curious about how they came to that decision about weight when you were, the research would tell you it's gestational age that's so much more critical. So here's a um, from the Minnesota Parents Know website, a little piece. Okay, so it can affect the child's development. And I know I've got to 11, so I'm going to go a little more quickly. But this is just to give you an idea of it's not a great picture when the parents said they're on tape. But just, you know, even not even being able to just access your child but going in through the four holes and some parents feel really um, they're worried they look at their baby and they know they could make their baby sick and so they don't even want to touch and I know one parent shared that she had declined the, the nurse said oh you, you could put your hands and I'll help you and she said no no I, I'll just watch and they had to write down the parent refused to touch their baby so these are all the things that start to happen for parents where they're struggling with this whole thing and, and they're parenting in a very public kind of place. So premature birth is really stressful because you go from the uterus where everything is pressurized and the nutrition comes and you have the right, you know, everything is just right to, to the incubator. Um, and these are the things that even sights, smells, sounds, and pain. And there are people that will tell you to this day, even though their children are older, there are certain smells that send them into a panic and they have much higher uh, heightened awareness of pain. So you would think it might be less. You think, oh, if you endure painful heel sticks in the NIC, wouldn't you then become accustomed to that? And actually your body works differently. It raises the level where if anything touches your foot that you think is going to hurt it, you're already in a fight or flight. Um, where else? I wanted to get, there. I have a lot of resources for parents about things that were in here. This is a really interesting one too, just looking at um, what the brain is like at 22 weeks versus 28 weeks. So if you're born here, 
instead of here. Just look how much work your brain has to do to be here. And so many of these children will physically develop well in things, and then right along the time where they're supposed to start to read or um, do more higher order thinking, they have some difficulties. And I think they're just different learners. <coughs> their whole pathway in their brain has developed very differently. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, these are some of the cues that premature babies give. Like I said, here's a baby, he's looking out into the world, but you see he's a little cautious. And when a full-term baby gets startled, they do this. They pull themselves together and they tuck their legs. And preemies, because their muscle tone is a different place, I call it flying apart, but this is called um, a salute. They do this. Their whole body just opens up and gets even more stimulated. So these are some examples of that. I'm not going to do the links. I wanted to get to something else. So you can imagine having a premature baby is a very different experience for the parents too. Instead of being able to, um, whoops, let me go backwards. I can't go backwards. Okay. Um, instead of being able to take a baby home, they have to go home without a baby. Then they have to have this tremendous amount of trust in the hospital to be able to care for their baby, and they worry what's going to happen there. Then they come in and a lot of times it's really the professionals that can do the care for the baby, not even them. So all of <coughs> struggling to find this balance and NICU staff are wonderful. They know this. They used to not know this. They used to just say, just let us do it. <laughs> and they now know for the long-term survival and thriving of the baby, they have to help that parent-child relationship develop. So they work very hard. But I, one of the things I did in my parent circle class that I was talking about is I gave people a list of the 10 most annoying things that people say to NICU parents. And here are these parents that are crying and they're so distressed, they look at the list and they actually start laughing. They say, every one of them. <laughs> like, don't worry, everything's going to work out. Don't you think you should go back to work? Things could be worse. And they said, like, how much worse do you think it could be? <laughs> so anyway, there's just some things that are kind of a common bond amongst parents and premiums. They've heard all these things and they've had to cope with them. Okay, so here's, you know, I put together a list of, um, you know, kind of the differences in parenting. And then the other thing is, these babies too, they're, when you have a full-term baby at home, as stressful as crying is in a newborn, so your newborn is crying and then you think, oh, do they need to eat, do you need a diaper? But generally, you get a lot of practice with that. So over, over the first couple of weeks, even you start feeling like you know how to do this. Well, you have a preemie who's not really alert, less responsive. They don't modulate their state at all. They go from being totally sleeping to oh, crying. There's just nothing in between. They have some really irregular behaviors because their reflexes aren't integrated. They startle. And all of these things taken together do not <laughs> engender confidence on the part of parents. So learning how to interpret this is really important. Other thing is the babies are so small and fragile. So I want you to think again. Look at your hand. Look at the baby's head and just start thinking now when you are seeing this in real time what this means to you. Um, the babies can get lost in technology. Some babies, um, you know, it's, it's hard to even see where the baby is because there's so many machines and things going on. Uh, there's another thing, though, that I always love to teach parents about, and this is like what I want to tell you about God's creation. Um, when ba premature babies were first cared for in hospitals, they were very careful to regulate the temperature. Nobody could touch them. They did everything they thought was going to make the baby get better, and a lot of times they didn't. In fact, there was a whole era where they took them on freak shows in the circuses. People would actually, because you didn't think your baby would survive, you just walked away from it, and they would take these babies in incubators and at the World Fairs exhibit them. Well, and what they discovered was that babies really need their parents. There's a wonderful um, person named Dr. Heidelis Alls that started thinking about this, what these cues meant, and why does the baby fly apart instead of pull together, and she got it all together. And she was the one that advocated that babies should be placed on their parents' chest and do what's called kangaroo care. It's like mother of kangaroo. And at first, I remember working at Children's, they would write an order, you, the, five minutes and then they would get you all ready get your chest bare they would put the baby on you and then they'd start clocking and then <laughs> and they would watch you know was the temperature going up I mean, it was crazy and what they discovered is as soon as the baby gets to the mother's chest that mother if you took her temperature 
Dr. All said it looked like they were getting fever. That mother's body immediately said this baby has to be warm and shot her temperature up. As soon as the baby told her body, we're right, her temperature came, and they totally danced. The other thing is when you're a preemie, you should be in the womb and you should be doing a lot of time of sleeping, but you don't because now you're in the ICU and you're poking your finger and taking this and putting it in your head and then it's diaper change. It's like, oh, it's exhausting to be a preemie. Dr. Alls found out that not only does the mother's body regulate, but the baby, because they, when they were in the womb, they tasted amniotic fluid and they got them, hmm, this is how my mom's body tastes. Well, when you're up on your mother's chest, the breasts are secreting a little bit of um, fluid, and that smells right to the baby, and the baby totally relaxes. So babies that do kangaroo care can get the deep rest and um, sleep that they need in order to recover. So now when you go into the hospital, they're like, when can we be here for kangaroo care? We'd like to schedule a two-hour session. The parents are like, what? <laughs> I'm going to sit in a chair for two hours? But they know it's so much better for the babies. The other thing that was really interesting is that getting a premature baby to coordinate their suck, swallow, and breathing in order to feed is really hard. And in order to breastfeed, you have to have a pretty darn good suck to get that milk out. And so that is another struggle. The research showed that babies that did kangaroo care, because they stayed warm, because they got a deep sleep when they woke up, they were much more alert, and because they'd been smelling that breast milk, they would actually find their way down and be licking, and they actually got themselves to breastfeed. <laughs> it is it is so remarkable. So I just these are the exciting things I would share with parents. And they were like, I just remember some parents going down and just about opening up their blouse, put that baby. <laughs> <laughs> they would just be so ready after my talk and one of them said, Oh, I couldn't figure out why the nurse was so into this. But I'm an educator, so I always think you gotta motivate the learner. <laughs> so that's kangaroo care. But parents still feel all of these feelings. And I love this. Um, sometimes, even after the crises are over, because there's a group of chickens and preparing an egg cart saying we couldn't get a sitter. Um, sometimes parents with preemies are really reluctant to take a break, and it can make them feel really anxious. And I know what Dr. Barry Brasselton always would say to those parents is, but you don't want your child to grow up thinking there's something wrong with him. You know, that you're so anxious that you are then now carrying this feeling over to the child. So that was another way of just using some humor with parents about who could you trust <laughs> to do it. And then, you know, people get home, and these are quotes from some of the parents. I jumped as soon as he cried. I didn't get any sleep. I mean, I know parents of full-term baby savers, too, but, um, you know, here, feeling like you had to make up, you felt guilty, you know, felt, you know, paranoid about the weight and all of that kind of thing. So these things, anybody who's had a newborn, you know, it's hard. But you, I think you could multiply that exponentially and just what it's like for parents of preemies to come home. So the other thing I shared in the webinar were many resources. Um, oh, this is another thing. So when I first started working with parents of preemies, it was back in the day before we had like, oh, everybody had computer and email and online groups. And I'm telling you, people felt so isolated. When they would come to our preemie play group, they would just cling to one another because nobody understood them. Their friends with full-term babies would listen, but they make the funniest comments. But now there are all these fabulous online groups, and there are, like, <clears throat> I know Shelly, um, you know, her daughter is now 18. She'll sometimes go online and look for parents that she can respond to. So I just wanted to wanted you to know that life for parents of preemies is better because there are online communities that really help their mental health. Um, and then the Minnesota Parents Know site we developed a series of videos on postpartum depression, creamy health. Pete McCauley is on it with his wife. Uh, ben was born at 25 years of age. And they're, they're short videos. So on the Minnesota Parents Know What site, if you're here as an educator or you're, there may be many things that you could use in your classes, that's what I'm trying to say, that are short things that really help students get the authentic voice of parents. So one quick story I wanted to share is I teach an online class through the University of Minnesota um, called Premature Babies and Their Parents. And it's for early intervention for personnel to learn more about the experience parents go through. So I have many parents that have told their story. And um, this is no kidding, this happens to me. I'm in the parking lot at Minneapolis Public Schools going out and I run into someone and 
I find out that she works at Minneapolis School, like I did at that point, but also she's parent of I said, oh, tell me more. So we're standing in the parking lot. She said, well, actually, her child was the poster child for the March of Dimes 24 years ago. And I had a remarkable story about, you know, she had had losses in pregnancy and all this, but this little boy. So I asked her to come to my class. Um, I was doing a class for Minneapolis school staff trying to get them to say, when you go out to these parents, there are so many things you need to know about what they've gone through. It's 24 years later, and this woman had to be with the audience, because as she began to speak, she was in the moment of where all of that had been. So it's a very, very powerful experience that parents have, and they carry it with them, and they carry those stories with them themselves. Um, and again, so one of my messages that we were trying to get out was we wanted parents to know to call Help Me Grow or go online to Help Me Grow because maybe your child didn't qualify in the beginning for early intervention because they weighed more than two pounds by ounces. But maybe as a parent you have an intuitive sense that things are not right. And I'm forgetting, oh, Ellen, this is somebody that we have at the center. A parent was telling me about some misgivings she was having about her eight month old and I was really encouraging her to call. So, that was good. So I think I'm going to stop it there because I know we're almost done, but if I could take a couple questions or um, anything. When I see that March of Dimes commercial that they say you should wait mm -hmm. 40 weeks, my first thought is always, like, you have any control over that? You know, if, the, if something's happening in your body and the mom's body and it right. goes into labor. So you can say, oh, well, I'm going to wait two more weeks. I can tell you why that is. Okay. Okay, part of it is you're right. You cannot control your body, and so nobody that gives birth prematurely should. However, the March of Dimes did a study, and there are many, many elective inductions where people go and take Tocin because they say, oh, I'm just kind of sick of being pregnant. And, they, and then there's this mythology out there, oh, these preemies do fine. They're going to do fine, and so if I have my baby early, it's and um, so March of Dimes did a study, and it was all these uh, OB kind of people that weren't really wanting to listen until the insurance company said, thou shalt not do this, because this costs us a lot of money. Um, I can think of many babies I knew that were just a couple weeks early, and they had severe respiratory distress. They had to go on a ventilator. Going on a ventilator gives you risk for long-term lung problems, um, and so on. Which makes me think about another mom I worked with. Oh, my goodness. Her first child was born healthy and full term and was about four years old when she was pregnant with her second child. And um, she went to the doctor for one of those routine things and she, like many other women, heard, you are in early labor, you need to go on bed rest, you need to go to the hospital. So she did. And as she was there, she was sort of incredulous that this could be happening. She was very worried about her four year old. And so she did some things during her bed rest where she didn't um, call for the bed pan. She called and went to the bathroom. But anyway, then the next day her baby came early. Now, whether or not the fact she went potty by herself is, I don't know. But in her mind, she was one of those, this is what really taught me about this. She said, oh, 28 weeks gestation. I know somebody that had a baby at 20. It's all going to be great. So she delivers this baby, and she's really out of it. And then they wheeled her down a few hours later to look. What? You know, so, um, uh, that, you know, so, right, she didn't have control, but, you know, they do. So I think I thought it was. Um, I had worked with the March of Dimes Coalition for the last couple of years on that campaign about, and I was shocked that they went to the full forty weeks until I called and I found out that they said, yeah, but the research is so strong. So that commercial is all about putting in the public's mindset. Never mind this cute creamy in your hands and everything is great. We're gotta think we gotta get this baby all the way to the end. And Keith, you, where's Keith? He was saying about his baby was born hanging on, didn't want to come out a week late. <laughs> so maybe that baby heard that commercial. Sure, it's 40 weeks. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Or? Well, good luck. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.